from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Coming up today, K-State's Sarah Lancaster will talk about the herbicide considerations when replacing failed winter wheat with an alternate crop. She'll emphasize the wide variation in waiting interval, depending on the replacement crop and the herbicide compound itself. Then, on the latest edition of FSA Coffee Talk, Dara Conley invites you agricultural producers to apply for assistance through the USDA's WIP Plus program relating to crop losses from weather extremes the past two growing seasons. And later, K-State's Charlie Lee, this week talking about the spawning habits of the leading sport fish in Kansas, which can serve as a good guide to fishing success. All that and more here on Agriculture Today. For information on threatening weather, you should depend on the National Weather Service and their broadcast on NOAA Weather Radio. NOAA Weather Radio is an all-hazards radio network that provides up-to-the-minute weather information, including life-saving warnings anytime, day or night. NOAA Weather Radio also broadcasts information on man-made disasters, such as chemical spills, amber alerts, or other national emergencies. For the National Weather Service, I'm Bill Curtis. You're listening to Agriculture Today. As many of you are well aware now, the winter wheat crop in Kansas took a humongous hit from the consecutive nights of freezing temperatures in mid-April, to the point where more than a few acres will likely be abandoned and replanted to an alternative crop. If that is the case for you as a producer, you need to be aware of the herbicide considerations before committing to that second crop. And to fill us in on that now, Sarah Lancaster. Sarah is a research and extension weed science specialist at Kansas State. Sarah, this is something, first of all, we want to stress producers need to be aware of, that herbicide carryover may not be in their favor when they try to get that replacement crop going. Right. So a lot of the the herbicides that producers are going to use in wheat, Eric, some of them are going to have some pretty long rotation intervals. And so when I say rotation interval, I'm just talking about the time that needs to pass between when that herbicide is applied and when it's safe to plant another crop. So herbicides we put in the soil to control weeds, and so we want them to stick around. And so that that length of time it takes for that herbicide to dissipate to a safe level varies from herbicide to herbicide and from crop to crop. So unfortunately, there's no real fast and easy answer on this that goes across the board, but we have to be aware of how long those herbicides stick around. So some of the more common ones that are used in wheat, like the sulfonylurea herbicides, things like Ally, Glean, some of those can have some fairly long rotation intervals. Months and months of rotation intervals, as a matter of fact. Months and months, potentially, depending on environmental conditions. So when we start thinking about really high pH soils, sulfonylureas tend to stick around longer in those really high pH soils um, that we might find in some parts of the state. Of course, those intervals are listed on the label of every product. So producers, first and foremost, need to do the simplest thing here, study the labels, right? Exactly. So that information is on the labels. But admittedly, Eric, it can be a little confusing sometimes because there's lots of nuance to that different environmental conditions in terms of soil pH or even rainfall can vary. And then there's also, you know, some differences in terms of situations. So some of the labels um, will actually have a statement that as long as the grower is willing to, to tolerate a certain level of crop injury, you can plant back at say 45 days versus 90 days for some of these herbicides. So it's important that it, when you go to these labels, that you look for those details because there's some nuance to those labels. And of course, we're not going to list through all of the herbicide products, but there is a handy reference in the recent agronomy e-update newsletter that covers all of that in detail, how many days or months per individual crop one would have to wait before safely planting grain, sorghum, corn, soybeans, sunflower, whatever it might be. Is there the potential here, Sarah, for 
selecting a replacement crop that will be resistant to the herbicides that may be residing on that acreage right now. Absolutely, Eric. So probably the most common would be to think about soybeans that are tolerant to ALS inhibiting herbicides. So we've had STS products around for quite a while. Those are an option. Um, Bolt um, is another brand name that is associated with soybean varieties that actually have a little greater tolerance for some of those ALS inhibiting herbicides. So those would be good, probably pretty common options that folks might consider, but there's a wide variety of of crops that have been selected or developed to have tolerance to those ALS inhibiting herbicides. So if you if you are thinking that you're probably going to not have enough time between the time when you applied your herbicide to safely plant something, say, um, for example, grain sorghum, perhaps considering some of those herbicide resistant varieties would be a good a good way to go. What about cultural practices? Would it help to till that soil up once you've done away with the wheat crop or do away with the wheat by way of tilling? Will that dilute the herbicide carryover at all? You're not going to really dilute it. Um, If you think about the depth that you're going to be tilling and the depth that those um, seeds are going to try to be germinating in, you're probably not going to be very successful at diluting You know, you can think about trying to get seeds placed below that herbicide. But again, that's going to be a little bit of a a risky option in that case. So unfortunately, there's just not a ton of good cultural options out there. You know, you kind of you've got what you've got. And so you've got to select your next crop accordingly. It really comes back to crop selection. There is a tool helping a producer determine what route to go here. It's called a field bioassay. What is that? That's just a fancy way of saying that you're going to go plant some test strips and then evaluate those emerging seedlings to see if they tolerated the herbicide residues that are in the soil or not. So if those seedlings come up healthy, you can feel confident about going in and planting. But if those seedlings come up and they germinate poorly, they have some sort of injury um, that is consistent with the herbicide in question, then you know that maybe that's not a good choice. So, and producers thinking about going to grain sorghum might want to think about this, or producers that, you know, maybe are on that kind of the bubble there, maybe a little bit of if they think they've been close to that interval, but haven't quite reached, say, the 90-day period or not. But they need to allow for a bit of time for that test plot to emerge and show something anyway. Right, exactly. So, you know, you're going to have to do that a couple of weeks out ahead of of what your your target planting date is and do a little bit of planning in that regard um, or, or push your planting date back. But, yeah, so it, it's, it's not an overnight answer. <laughs> okay. We haven't talked yet, Sarah, about how to rid of that failed wheat crop uh, that may still be hanging on but is not going to be productive. The the producers made the decision to get rid of it. Completely knocking it out, one might think that glyphosate would be an alternative here. So glyphosate is an alternative, but depending on the current health of the wheat crop, so how well it's growing, how much it's recovered from that freeze injury in terms of the the new foliage, the new leaves that are growing, um, that will determine if your glyphosate will be successful or not. So in order for the glyphosate to work, it's got to get in the plant and get to that active site. And so if you have a plant that has recently been damaged by the freeze and doesn't have a lot of current growth or has a lot of damaged uh, leaf tissue there that's not going to absorb that glyphosate, it's not going to work very well. So giving yourself a little bit of, you know, you're going to give give that wheat crop some time to see what that damage really is anyway in terms of yield potential. And so by the time this wheat crop has grown a couple of weeks, hopefully it's putting on some new leaves. And But you have to have that active growth there for the glyphosate to be taken in. If not glyphosate, could other products perform this same purpose? You know, you really don't want to go with Um, The more contact types of herbicides that you might think about, things like Paraquat or or even um, Liberty, because, again, they're not going to get to that crown necessarily of the wheat crop to totally kill it. So you'll have to to deal with some regrowth. This is why those aren't as effective on grass control as glyphosate 
um, in general, in terms of general herbicide recommendations. Mm -hmm. But, you know, other things you could think about might potentially be some of those, quote, germinicides, those grass herbicides, things like your select, your clethodim. Um, those would have um, a relatively short replant interval to most crops, but would be effective at controlling that wheat crop. That might be something else to think about. There is probably further information on this and everything else we've talked about today in the K-State Chemical Weed Control Guide, is there not? Eric, you are so <laughs> right. So much information in that K-State Chemical Weed Control Guide. So it's a great reference for producers and can, you know, it's not going to have everything that the labels have, but it can have a lot of those restrictions and things of that nature. So, so the combination yep. of the two will help producers make the right decision on uh, crop selection following failed wheat. Wanted to finish with this, Sarah. You are actually taking a survey now of producer use of the K-State Chemical Weed Control Guide. Visit about that if you would. We know that that chemical weed control guide is a very valuable reference for folks, but we want to, you know, we've got a season of change here, right? Right. So we've got an opportunity to take a look at that and figure out how producers are using it so we can best target printed versions and potentially electronic versions or more accessible electronic versions to producers as we think about how and where folks are using the guide and you know, what information is most important to maybe feature on electronic versions that might be forthcoming. So we've pushed the survey out through social media. We've pushed it out through the e-update. I would be happy to, to send surveys through county agents. Your county extension agent will have access to that electronic copy, and they could even get paper copies if needed. So we're just looking for some good feedback from folks. Contact your local Extension Agricultural agent. You can also touch base with Sarah at slancaster at ksu.edu. Sarah, for all of this, many thanks. We'll get together again soon. All right. Thanks, Eric. Sarah Lancaster, she's a K-State Research and Extension Weed Science Specialist. And you're listening to Agriculture Today with more after this over the K-State Radio Network. Make hand washing a healthy habit everywhere you go. Wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, especially after going to the bathroom, before, during, and after preparing food, and before eating. If soap and water aren't available, use a hand sanitizer that has at least 60% alcohol. Life is better with clean hands. A message from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. You're listening to Agriculture Today, and welcome back. Once more, every other Tuesday, we set aside this time slot to bring you the latest from the Farm Service Agency State Headquarters for Kansas. We're calling it the FSA Coffee Talk. And doing the honors this time around is a program specialist with the Farm Programs Division of the Kansas FSA, Dara Conley, with us. Welcome, Dara. Good to have you aboard. Hey, thanks for talking with me today, Eric. I'm glad for this opportunity to talk to your listeners on behalf of our Farm Programs Division. Today, I'd like to let them know a little more about an active disaster program we are working through called WIP Plus. WIP Plus is an acronym, obviously. And let's get right to that then, because this is a program that definitely might have application for our Kansas agricultural producers out there. What is WIP Plus? WIP Plus stands for Wildfires and Hurricanes Indemnity Program Plus. It was a program that was written to provide assistance to eligible producers for crops, trees, bushes, and vines, which suffered losses because of the consequences of Hurricanes Michael and Florence, and other hurricanes, um, as well as floods, snowstorms, tornadoes, typhoons, volcanic activity, and wildfires. Um, occurring in calendar years 2018 and 2019. So with that said, Eric, I'll bet your listeners are wondering why on earth is Dara talking about a program <laughs> written for hurricanes and wildfires right about now? <laughs> well, for certain hurricanes and wildfires, hopefully we're moving past that season here in Kansas. So as to why you are highlighting this program now and how WIP Plus can be beneficial to Kansas agricultural producers. Elaborate on that, Dara. 
In March this year, a national notice was released that added drought and excessive moisture to the list of qualifying disaster events of the hurricanes, floods, snowstorm, tornadoes, typhoons, volcanic activity, and wildfires that we mentioned before for the crops that were grown and specifically in years 2018 and 19 for the WIP Plus program. So with the inclusion of drought and excessive moisture, this was a big game changer for Kansas ag producers due to the 2018 widespread drought and excessive moisture suffered in areas of Kansas in 2018 and 2019. So the scope of eligibility is cast pretty widely across Kansas. It's worth noting here that uh, for those losses due to drought, one is eligible if any area of their county in which that loss occurred was rated D3 on the drought scale or extreme drought or higher on the U.S. drought monitor for 18 or 19. Well, before producers would be contacting their local FSA offices and talking over the prospects of participating in WIP Plus, what should they know about it beforehand? Well, producers need to know that WIP Plus does not cover crops with intended uses of grazing. All other intended uses of crops grown in 2018 and and, and in 2019 may be eligible if there was a loss suffered due to a qualifying disaster event of flood, snowstorm, tornadoes, wildfire, drought, and excessive moisture. Uh, Producers who wish to apply for WIP Plus uh, will need to meet a requirement called linkage which is their agreement to carry insurance at a 6,100 level um, on the commodities that they want to make application on for WIP Plus. The linkage insurance requirement will be specifically for years 2022 and 2023. So when they sign up for WIP Plus, they're also agreeing to insure themselves on those commodities for 2022 and 2023. Another thing producers might want to understand, too, is If they receive the top-up benefit from RMA uh, for prevented planted acres planted in 2019 specifically, um, they won't need to apply for WIP Plus because top-up was their benefit to be earned for those prevented planted uh, 2019 acres uh, for those insured producers. So if producers are willing to meet linkage for 2022 and 2023 and were affected by the qualifying disaster events that we mentioned in 2018 and 2019, um, they really need to be given their local FSA offices a call for some relief for those losses suffered in those years. We're ready to help. Excellent. Now, as we all know, different producers carry different kinds of insurance coverage at different levels. So is this to say that all producers are eligible for WIP Plus regardless of that coverage? Um, That's a great question. And yes, all producers would be eligible regardless of insurance coverage level. In fact, while we have uh, discussed multi-parallel covered producers, uh, producers with NAP coverage and even uninsured producers are also eligible as long as they suffer from a primary loss event and, as we've mentioned before, agree to that linkage requirement for these future years. So, Dara, do producers need to provide information on that coverage or any other vital information as they would apply for the WIP Plus program? Um, That will vary depending on insurance coverage, uh, NAP coverage, or uninsured producers. So for our insured producers, both multi-parallel and and NAP producers as well, we are able to uh, load the application from some internal reports that, that we have Um, based on information that we're sharing with with RMA. Um, But uninsured producers will need to um, complete a notice of loss, and they will have to provide their own production records to FSA. And that notice of loss details, if they're not familiar with that documentation, the FSA local personnel can help with that then. Yes, that notice of loss is is basically our, our WIP Plus application. Okay. Is there a deadline as to when producers should apply for this program? Um, We do not have a deadline at this time, but, you know, producers are really encouraged to take this window of opportunity to reach out to their respective administrative counties um, to discuss WIT Plus with them because, you know, we are just kind of at this little moment in time where 
we might have a pause before we get geared up, you know, and get those planners running at full force. So, you know, our, our county office employees would really like to talk with plus with them now before they get too busy in the field. And again, in respect to eligible crop losses suffered in 2018 and 2019, that is the Wildfire and Hurricanes Indemnity Program Plus, or WIP Plus, and it, it does now include excessive and drought moisture conditions, as they may have afflicted crop producers here in the past couple of years. Any other program reminders out of your office worth passing along here as well, Dara? Yeah, sure, Eric. One thing we want to make sure that our, our listeners know is that we're open. Um, FSA, I know we're all under under COVID right now and, and kind of all have some different operating procedures um, in response to that, but, but our FSA offices are open. Um, producers, though, just want to make sure that they call the office and just be prepared to have a lot of correspondence by way of, of email and mail and, and just, you know, some of those business practices at this time. And, you know, once we're able, we're going to get those appointment schedules um, happening. But right now during this, again, you know, during this COVID pandemic, we just want to make sure that we, you know, we're keeping producers and, and keeping keeping our employees safe. Um, another item I want to mention is, you know, as the our Kansas farmers are wrapping up their springtime plannings, um, I want to encourage them to also contact their local FSA offices, you know, by phone to establish an appointment to report their spring planted acreage. While the deadline isn't really until July 15th, um, we'll be completing um, appointments only. So if we can spread the volume out over a long period of time instead of waiting, it, it's going to be very helpful to our county offices. So as soon as a producer has that spring planted acreage figure in mind, you'd like them to get that taken care of. And that's a rather straightforward procedure, but it's important for all manner of farm program details, isn't it? That's correct. You know, Mother Nature doesn't always give us that that uh, large window uh, to see and service all producers, you know, um, on a stretched out period of time. Sometimes she she pushes us pretty close pretty hard and pretty close to that July 15th date. But, you know, as much as we can help it, we really want to make sure that we get everyone serviced in good time before that July 15th deadline. Take care of that business, farmers, as soon as you possibly can. And, of course, on these and any other matters regarding farm service agency business, keep that dialogue going with your local FSA folk via phone, via email at this point to get all of that business, whatever it might be, taken care of in a prompt fashion. Dara, thanks for the update specifically on the WIP Plus program option, and we will visit with you again on down the line. We appreciate it. Sounds great. Thanks, Eric. She's Dara Conley, and she is a program specialist with the Farm Programs Division of the Kansas Farm Service Agency State Headquarters here in Manhattan. Dara has been with us on this latest edition of FSA Coffee Talk. You are listening to Agriculture Today, now these moments away. When we return, today's agricultural news headlines are coming your way. That'll include the weekly crop progress and condition report for Kansas out of the USDA. Standing by for his weekly visit on dairy management, K-State's Mike Brook with Milk Lines. And again, our weekly segment with K-State's Charlie Lee. All that coming right up here on the K-State Radio Network. When you are in need of timely, reliable, and trusted information, K-State Research and Extension is here. Whether it's organizing people, information, or resources, they have the necessary tools. Community comes first for K-State Research and Extension. For more information and to connect with your county's extension agents, visit www.ksre.k-state.edu. Broadcasting from the campus of Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here, moving on now to today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. Notable progress in row crop planting achieved this past week in Kansas, according to the state crop progress and condition update from the USDA. For the week ending on Sunday, our topsoil moisture around the state at 
5% surplus, 56% adequate, and 39% short to very short. The subsoil moisture at 4% surplus, 68% adequate, 28% short to very short there. The condition of the winter wheat crop actually improved two percentage points from the previous week. 42% good to excellent and uh, 36% fair, 22% poor to very poor. Winter wheat now jointed at 79%. That is still behind the 84% for the five-year average. And wheat headed in Kansas at 17% now, still behind the 34% average for the day. Corn planting in the state, 42% complete now. That's very near the average. Emergence at 13%. Soybeans planted at 11% now. Emergence at 1%. And grain sorghum planted 2% now. Cotton planting, 4% complete. Range and pasture conditions in the state this week, 56% good to excellent, 33% fair, and 11% poor to very poor. Now for the latest on national corn and soybean planting progress, here's the USDA's Stephanie Ho. USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey says a slow-moving storm system in the Midwest had an impact on corn and soybean planting. And so we really see a significant gulf in the planting progress for corn and soybeans across the Midwest, ranging from very little progress in the east to near record to record setting progress in some western states. Nationally, 51 percent of corn has been planted compared to a five-year average of 39 percent and more than double last year's pace of 21 percent. For the second consecutive week, we're seeing our most remarkable progress in the western corn belt. We had three states planting at least a one-third of their intended acreage just in the last week. Meanwhile, he had the latest on soybean planting. Rather quick compared to what we typically see, 23% complete on that date. That is more than twice the five-year average of 11% and dramatically faster than last year's 5% complete. This is Stephanie Ho for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. And the Small Business Administration announced yesterday it would be opening up its emergency economic injury disaster loan programs for agricultural producers. Those loans go directly through SBA, providing individual grants to small businesses for up to $10,000. Those are grants. The idle loans can go as high as $2 million for small businesses. These loans are not forgiven, but the program allows low interest loan rates of three and three quarters percent for up to 30 years and not limited in what they can be used for compared with the SBA's other emergency loan aid, the Paycheck Protection Program. Coming up next, this week's edition of Milk Lines. Here's K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook. Mike? Today, I'd like to visit with our Kansas dairy farmers concerning some data that was recently published by our Milk Market Administrator. Every year, the Milk Market Administrator provides us some insight into how the component testing on our various farms has been going over the last year. So when we think about protein production and we think about fat production on our dairy farms, it's very, very important because that directly relates to our paychecks. So as we think about that, what happened in 2019, we actually saw an increase in the uh, percentage fat found in milk shipped off uh, Kansas dairy farms. We averaged across the order 3.917% butter fat and protein uh, test was also up averaging 3.185% across our farms here in the central milk marketing order. And for both uh, fat and protein percentages, this was above uh, 20 year averages. And really we've had a trend since about, uh, well, in terms of butter fat since really started about 2011 and in gradual increase in butter fat percentages found in milk shipped off of our farms. And the same is pretty much true for protein as well, that that trend has seen an increase pretty much every year as we move forward since 2011. Also interesting is where we average on uh, somatic cell count. And again, hats off to you producers. You've been doing an excellent job. For 2019, uh, the milk in the uh, the central order averaged a somatic cell count of 203,000. That's slightly above 2018 average, which was 195,000, and the low for the last 20 years as well. So we're well below uh, our 20-year average for somatic cell count uh, on milk uh, exiting our farms here in the central order, which is a great thing. 
Now, I want to uh, challenge you a little bit. As you look at uh, monthly averages, uh, let's look uh, first at butterfat test. Butterfat test here in the central order typically is average less during the month of July compared to uh, other months. In the month of July, over uh, the last uh, 20 years, we generally average about 3.558% butterfat in the milk coming off of our farms. This is likely due to heat stress and some changes that the animals normally make as they try to select for more concentrate and less uh, forage out of the rations that we're feeding. And uh, you'll probably see more sorting in the summer. So here's a challenge for you. You know, we typically lose uh, maybe about 0.15 to maybe 0.4% on butterfat during the summertime, during the heat stress uh, time. Uh, This has a significant negative impact on our paychecks. So trying to do what you can do to uh, combat heat stress this summer might be an important way to maintaining a higher uh, fat test. Also, uh, as we look at protein, we see the same sort of situation that we generally see a drop in milk protein during the heat stress during the summer. And over the last uh, 20 years, that drop has been about 0.1%. So again, it's a drag on your milk check. So as you think about things that you might be able to do to maintain a higher milk check this summer, need to really be spending some time with your nutritionist to determine what you might be able to do to increase uh, butterfat percentages uh, during the summer as well as protein percentages during the summer so that we can uh, receive a higher amount of uh, income in our milk checks uh, during summer heat stress. So this is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension, encouraging our dairy farmers to take a look at component production on their farms, particularly in the summertime, to see what they can do to increase production during the summer to help maintain higher levels of milk income coming onto the farm. Thanks, Mike. And this is Agriculture Today. Social distancing slows the spread of coronavirus. So if you have a fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath, call your health care provider before going in. More info at coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part, because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Agriculture Today is back now, and back with us is Wildlife Specialist with K-State Research and Extension, Charlie Lee, along with us each Tuesday to talk wildlife management. Today, Charlie on fish spawning. And uh, fishermen use this information, or can, to find those prime times to fish. Well, spawning is a word that's described the fish form of reproduction. And the most common way for fish to reproduce is by spawning. That is when the female lays her eggs in the water. The male will then come and fertilize as many eggs as they can. If you're an avid fisherman, you may or may not know about fish spawning. If you don't know, you probably should learn a little bit more because fish behavior changes when they're spawning. Do you know when your target fish spawns and how it changes their behavior, you can adapt your techniques to help you catch more fish. Some fish follow very definite spawning patterns, but that pattern changes depending upon the species you're interested in. Some change their location where they lay eggs. Sometimes um, that's shallower, sometimes it's deeper. Sometimes it's in cavities, sometimes it's in rocks, sometimes it's on other vegetative structure. So the concept for spawning is kind of the same for all fish, but there are differences depending upon the species. And we start with when fish spawn. There's very definite changes that initiate fish spawning. Fish reproduction tends to be primarily cued by photo period, how much light and dark there is in a day. But many fishermen rely on water temperature as a general guidance. Well, if those are the instigators, if you will, of spawning, those conditions, you might walk through chronologically, based on those conditions, which fish spawn earliest and which tend to spawn a bit later on in the season. Well, if we're just talking about warm water fish, and we would have a few northern pike in some of the water bodies in Kansas, They would be one of our earliest spawners. 
uh, during late winter, uh, they'll start spawning. Some will even spawn under the ice. Uh, so that would be the first spawning fish. Uh, next would be a very popular fish in Kansas, and that would be the walleye. They spawn in water temperatures that are in the upper 30s to the upper 40s. They have a sticky egg, and walleye lay their eggs on clean gravel if they have a choice. But if it's in impoundments and in lakes, they may spawn on riprap where waves have washed those rocks relatively clean. The next uh, species is kind of a tie between a group of fish, smallmouth bass, and black and white crappies. They tend to start spawning in the low 50s and end in the upper 50s to low 60s. All of these fish are, are nest builders. The males build the nest. They attract a ripe female, and then they guard the nest after the eggs are fertilized. The eggs then hatch into fry, which spend a few days in the nest absorbing the yolk sac. After that, the fry find their own way, and they like that rocky habitat in which they need for a place to hide. All three of those species are considered solitary nesters, but the nests often are in close proximity to each other. They're just not clumped into colonies. The next would be a very popular fish in Kansas, and that's the largemouth bass. They spawn just after crappie and in smallmouths, water temperatures starting in the low 60s, running up the upper 60s or 70s. They also spawn in solitary nests with males guarding the eggs and then the fry. The pre-spawn is when bass are starting to eat more. They increase the amount of food they eat because they know they're not going to do much eating while they're actually spawning. But when bass are spawning, they become very aggressive. Uh, species that they used to feed on will now be the ones they attack just to keep their eggs safe. During the post-spawn, the eggs have hatched and the males guard the newly hatched fish while the females leave to rest into deeper water. And then last of all of the fishes would be catfish to spawn. And they even have their own order. Channel catfish would spawn before flatheads. Catfish spawning behavior is also variable. The bullheads are actually nest builders. Channel cat would be those that are going to nest in uh, spawn in cavities like hollow logs or undercut banks or other hollow type structure that people have added to ponds. So that makes a catfish fairly difficult to catch during spawning period because they're back in a cavity. It's difficult to get your baits back into those locations. So that's kind of the chronological order of the way fish are spawning. It happens in the spring, but it's, a, it's not a, something that's over very quickly. Depending on the species of fish, it can be quite prolonged. So as we speak, just to be particular here, we see smallmouth bass and crappie spawning at this point and largemouth bass soon to follow? Yeah, that's uh, very common. Uh, I think there are some water bodies where crappie have already begun spawning. Some are probably in the southern end of the state or kind of ending that time period. And in other more northern reaches, the crappie spawn is going good and strong currently. So once again, the ease of fishing, though, depends on the species, its spawning habits. So if one wants to set uh, reasonable expectations for their fishing outing, why they need to think about the spawning patterns of these individual species, Charlie. Yeah, the more they understand about fish biology, the more successful they're going to be at capturing them. That's a quick rundown of the spawning habits, again, of some of the more popular sport fish that we find in Kansas. And Charlie, as always, we appreciate the information. Charlie Lee is a wildlife specialist with K-State Research and Extension. And that'll do it for this edition. From time to time, we'd like to remind you that should you happen to miss one of our broadcasts any given day, you can hear a replay of that day's program via our website, which is agtoday.net. Every day's broadcast is archived there. And likewise, you can subscribe to our podcast service, where each day's broadcast is automatically downloaded to your mobile device. Very convenient. 
Find out more at agtoday.net. In the meantime, please be right back with us right here tomorrow. Until then, Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.